Um, my name is John Chidaki. I am um, part of the Force 11 Board of Directors, and I just want to welcome you all to the open source community call. Um, this is a series of community calls that we do that are around different open source and open science uh, topics. Um, they vary in topics. Our last one was about DEI issues and Skullcoms and Skullcoms tech. Um, and today we're really talking about interoperability within the tools pipeline for Skullcoms. And so things change from, from talk to talk and call to call. Um, it is a joint uh, series that is coordinated by Force 11, uh, which I represent. Uh, Force 11 is a community of free community for anyone in the Skullcoms world to come together to talk about the transformation of Skullcoms to more open models. Um, there's more information at force11.org. Uh, we run a conference that we just had in December, as well as a Scarly Communications Institute, which um, we're going to be sending out a call for proposals for courses uh, next week, I think. So keep an eye out for that. Um, it's also um, collaborated with eLife, which is an open access uh, journal in the biosciences and Dryad, which is a data repository for open data publishing. So we thank all three of those organizations for organizing these things um, and these calls. Uh, the way it works is really um, there is a set of panelists, there is a set of um, discussions that we are going to be talking about today. Um, I'll turn that over in a second, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, literally the same page. We used a crypt pad for, for managing these, these calls. And so I just put a link in the chat. And I'll continue to put the link in the chat throughout the session. Um, you can uh, go to that crypt pad and at the top of the page, you'll see the information about um, today's call and the code of conduct that we are all um, operating under a link directly to that code of conduct. So please review that. Um, you will also see that this, court, this call is being recorded and we will be posting the recording to YouTube um, within two weeks, but I expect that to happen pretty soon. That shouldn't take two weeks. And also one last thing is um, the, to, to share the link to the crypt pad, you need to have a special link. So there is a link to the crypt pad within the crypt pad. So if you share it, make sure you use that link and not the one from your browser. So um, if you're interested in passing it around, um, please do. And we have um, the agenda listed here on the crypt pad and down below you'll see that there's a note section. And this is a, this is a document, a shared document. We would love everybody's help. So um, first of all, please add your name. Uh, there's a roll call, please add your name and your affiliation just to let the world know that you were here. And then down below when, um, as people are talking throughout the, the discussion, make sure you add some notes. Um, anybody can add notes. This is a collaborative document and there will be no official quote unquote note taker. We're all in this together. So just add some notes as you go through it. Uh, besides that, I don't have any other housekeeping. If you have questions, you can put them in chat and I can answer them about housekeeping. But for the actual event, I'm going to pass this over to Rory, who will be helping moderate. So thank you again. Well, thank you very much, John. And thank you to Force 11 and uh, eLife and Dryad for, for making this possible. Um, and thank you everybody for attending. Um, this is, this is an, an exciting event and uh, we're gonna be talking about tool interoperability and fair principles. Sometimes these things that are actually aren't, aren't thought of together, but hopefully um, we'll make a case for why they should be thought of together. And we have, to put it mildly, I think a, a really exciting group of, of, of people um, gathered together today. They, they represent, uh, each of them represents uh, a, a forward thinking and, um, and really an innovative and thought leading organization. And each of them as individuals is also uh, very much uh, a thought leader. So it's, uh, it's, it's fun, interesting and, and exciting for me to be associated with, uh, with all of you. Uh, I'm going to try to set the scene a little bit. And then um, Maria and Danny and Julie are going to talk about the integration that's been done between uh, DMP tool, the R space ELN and Dataverse uh, and how this is used at Harvard to facilitate um, fair data principles. Uh, then we're going to kind of take a step up a little bit and Chris is going to give us uh, a domain perspective from the American Geophysical Union, which of course is extremely active on a whole variety of fronts in supporting, enhancing, and developing fair data principles. And then we're gonna take it up even a step further 
And Jeff Moon is going to talk about how these issues are, are, are taking place uh, in, in the Canadian overall research data environment. So uh, again, welcome everyone. And then at the end, and this is an important, we're gonna take about an hour to go through these, um, the, the various um, panelists uh, presentations. But then at the end, we'd like to have a discussion and uh, I, not a Q&A, but I, I know a lot of people who are attending are also themselves very active and also thought leaders. So it's intended to be more of a discussion than a Q&A. So when the time for that comes, please feel free to uh, give us your, your comments and input um, as well as asking questions. So with that, let me share my screen and my slides. So can everybody see my, my screen now? I'm just gonna try one thing, see yes. if the uh, slideshow will um, advance the slides or not. Um, it looks good. Did that yep, slide advance? Can you see the second slide or just the yes. first? Yep. You can see the great. second slide. Okay, perfect. All right, so uh, the topic of, of my presentation is enabling verification of data with tool interoperability. So what are some of the factors leading to the emergence of fair data as a, as a driving principle? I, I'm looking at this in a, a kind of a historical perspective, if you will, a chronological perspective going back, I don't know, say maybe 12 to 15 years, I suppose. So a number of things began to take shape. First, uh, a, co a core development was the development of, of general purpose repositories where data could be made public uh, and therefore shared and, and queried. At the same time, research data management as a field as a, and as an activity um, began to emerge. And then we began to get research data managers, data stewards, data librarians as recognized roles who were taking an active role in driving forward this whole new, new field. Uh, there's also um, an interesting trend from uh, kind of uh, research computing, research infrastructure centric to a more data-centric approach and mindset to dealing with uh, research data. And then uh, we've had now many, many organizations and initiatives, Fair is Fair, Go Fair, that are specially focused on, on verification of data, but lots of others like the AGU, like the RDA, et cetera, who are also actively involved in, in promoting FAIR. So we, we could say that this, um, going back to the, the repositories, what I've termed fair data uh, infrastructure, 0 0.5. So basically it was pretty simple. You had, a, you had a repository and you put some data in. How did you get the data in? Well, somehow that was pretty obscure, but once you got it in, then it could be, it could be queried. So that was really the, the beginning, if you will. Um, the second stage was the beginning of a move beyond a repository centric view and I think the emergence of DMPs and online DMPs were a core driver of this. Uh, and so as part of this, people began to think of, of the planning for research as well as the, as the end stage uh, as being part of, the, um, part of the process. And so we got what you might call Fair Data Infrastructure 1.0, where DMP Roadmap, is, which is the, um, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, underlies uh, DMP tool as well as uh, DMP assistant, DM, um, DMP online and, and others um, emerged as, as a core research data facility, uh, as a core promoter of fair data, uh, uh, and also as a core tool, one of the key tools that this new data stewards research data management community began to focus on. Um, and so planning and archiving came into the picture. Uh, however, uh, in my view, and I think, I think it, it, it's fair to say it in, in the view of others as well, this is maybe where we are today, but fundamental conceptual and practical limitations still limit the ability to realize fair data principles. And so some of the reasons that this is the case is that the research process is not linear 
as would seem to be implied by many of the, uh, the, the things that we see going on today, uh, nor is it static, it's rather dynamic and it's cyclical. Uh, so seeing repositories as, as the static destination of a one-way data flow vastly oversimplifies the reality of the research process because data is produced and manipulated in multiple resources at every stage of the research life cycle. There's a particular neglect of data produced and collected during the active research phase. I mean, right now we're focusing on the DMP tool as a planning tool and repositories as storage archiving facilities. They come at the beginning or the pre and the post active research, but actively, but, but actually um, the real heavy lifting goes on during the active research phase. And right now that's, that's, that's barely part of the picture for many of these discussions that are going on. So uh, verification of data requires recognizing the multiplicity of tools um, that support and manipulate data throughout the research process. There are some signs of movement, I think, beyond this 1.0 picture that I just put up, or caricature, I suppose you could say, but it's a picture anyway, uh, which to me are positive. And we're moving beyond, I think, the linear repository centric view. So some of the things which are, which are kind of helping us to, to break the barriers or, or conceptual thinking, I, I think, are a focus on, on PIDs and MADMPs. Um, the, the early beginning of a consideration of the active research phase as being an important part of this whole process as along with the planning and archiving storage phases, uh, you're beginning to get some tools that are specifically designed, architected uh, and implemented to facilitate data flows with other tools. So being designed for interoperability and you're beginning to see some integrations, some, some actual integrations between tools. So we're kind of taking as our starting point today, our, 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 um, our, our liftoff point, if you will, for this discussion, the integration that was recently completed between the DMP tool, RSpace, and Dataverse. And this exemplifies all four of those trends. And that will be the focus of, of, of the next section um, of the discussion. So with, with this, you could say, I would say, maybe we're actually breaking new ground. We're moving towards Fair Data Infrastructure 1.5, you could call it. So now we've got, uh, we've got multiple tools. Uh, we've got the incorporation of PIDs because as you'll see, as part of this integration, um, a PID is passed back from Dataverse back to the DMP tool uh, at the end of the process. Um, whoops, you've got, uh, let's move this, there we go. Um, you've got um, the active research phase is included because that's where our space comes in. And you've got a bi-directional uh, information flow because you've got the data moving in this direction, but you've got the PIDs moving back in the other direction. So all of these things are, are moving beyond the linear uh, cyclical um, constraints that uh, have, have, I think, um, uh, you know, uh, to some extent held back thinking um, in terms of verification of data. So let me now say, well, what would a vision for the future be? Um, what would um, um, Fair Data Infrastructure 2.0 or something we can all work towards look like? So here's my thoughts on this. So on the left, this is, I've taken this from University College London. It's the research data lifecycle and you've all seen millions of depictions of, of this. Um, and it goes from planning, uh, data collection, data storage on to, to data, uh, data sharing, publication, everything. Um, so again, it's, it's a secular, it's a secular view. Um, interestingly, I think in this, you'll see under data collection, which is let's call it the, it's actually a lot more than collection. This is the active data phase. This is the heavy lifting. This deserves a whole, a whole, a whole uh, bubble, which is, you know, bigger than the others. And you can see experiments, clinical trials, images, literature, actually, this is a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, so, and then we'd like to combine this idea with this data commons, and I put up um, uh, a slide of the um, uh, Harvard data commons that Mercedes Croesus had um, a while ago. And you can see that what's interesting here is in this slide, there's a whole bunch of tools primarily for use in the active data phase. This is where this will come in here. So these tools would be themselves interoperable, would come in in the active data phase, and then, and then would interact with the other 
uh, research data tools to have this uh, in, in the research data lifecycle. So you would have multiple intersections between active research, planning, and archiving storage tools, and you'd have data and PIDs flowing bi-directionally at all stages of the process. So with that, I'm going to stop, and I hope I've set the scene and maybe raised some, some food for thought, and I will pass it over to first to Maria and then uh, Danny and Julie, who are going to talk specifically about the tripartite integration I mentioned, as well as things that are more specific to their particular tools and also to Harvard. Great, thanks, Rory. Let me just go ahead and share my screen. All righty. There we go. All right, so uh, my name is Maria Pretzelis. I'm with the California Digital Library. And uh, one of the tools that I work on at CDL is the DMP tool um, that Rory's talked a little bit about. We are a free open source uh, community supported tool. We are about 10 years old now. And uh, over the past few years, we've really focused on building the next generation machine actionable data management plan. Um, so, you know, really flows with kind of what Rory was talking about, the evolution of fair data and the ways in which data management plans can support that. That's really been our primary focus um, for the past few years. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that uh, right now. So with networked um, data management plans, um, when we were thinking about how to make data management plans machine actionable, the first thing we really needed to do was create structured information. Um, so we needed a way to essentially mark up a data management plan to be able to extract all of the good metadata and information contained within a data management plan and make it interoperable so that we could share it with other systems. So to do that, we need to structure all of our data in the back end, we need to develop a robust API. Um, and so we really focused on that in the beginning. We've got all of those pieces in place now. So our focus has shifted to this next phase where we've been working on integrations with other systems to really realize the potential of the machine actionable DMP in order to network um, data management plans. So what do I mean when I say networked DMP? What I'm talking about really our goal in creating this new data management plan ecosystem is to facilitate the information that's contained within a DMP and to allow it to be communicated and shared across stakeholders and to make sure that it stays up to date as a living document. So it's used as, a, as research continues and progresses and changes those changes will be reflected in an automated way within the data management plan. So that's really what we're trying to build here. And the integration with our space was a, a really important piece of that and a way to demonstrate the potential of a networked DMP. And ultimately one of our key goals of this is also to lessen the administrative burden on researchers and grant administrators. This is these kind of um, updates to a data management plan and, and exchange of information should all be done in the back without any extra work for a researcher. The idea being that they actually are gaining um, new, new tools and, and resources that they could use um, to support their work without extra effort on their part. So those are our very lofty um, big picture goals there. Um, so as part of this, one of the first things we had to do was to get an identifier for the data management plan itself, and that's called the DMP ID. That was a core piece of this new system that we were building because it created an unbreakable link between the original data management plan and the eventual outputs that were connected to a plan. So say you have software connected to a plan or you have specific data sets or images or publications that all that information, all of those resources that were produced as part of a project are connected to your data management plan through the use of identifiers. So we have the identifier for the data management plan within the data within the DMP itself as part of what I was talking about in our first phase of work, well, essentially what we did was we pitified the DMP. So wherever possible, we exchanged free text for identifiers and structured our data, used controlled vocabularies and um, identifiers wherever possible so that we could have a um, structured document using unique identifiers so that we could interoperate 
and um, connect to the larger DOI um, PID ecosystem and use that existing infrastructure can, to update a data management plan over time. Um, again, we have a, a robust API that we built um, as part of this. That's what we're using for the R space integration. So um, just as a plug, if anyone listening has a um, application that you think you'd want to hook into the DMP tool that it might make for um, an interesting um, integration, please reach out. We're always looking for more folks to, um, to work with the API and to build these kind of integrations with us. Um, one other integration I wanted to mention that we did was integrating with ORCID. Um, this is where a user in the DMP tool, when they generate a DMP ID, <clears throat> it's automatically linked to that creator's ORCID record. So this was important because it facilitates credit for a good DMP. You can publicize and advertise your, your excellent um, research data management practices. It also improves transparency in the research process. So people can you know, state what, what work they're working on, what their expected outputs are, and what their data management plan practices are as well. So looking specifically at our integration with our space, Julie's going to go more into detail on this. Um, but so we really, um, in setting it up, it has sort of two phases. So support for DMPs as living documents within the active research phase. So researchers within our space, they can connect their DMP from the DMP tool and ingest it into our space. And then they can keep those DMPs up to date by connecting their outputs um, to a project documented in the original DMP. And we have a demo that so will show you exactly how that works. But essentially, you're uploading your DMP. And then when you're working in our space, you have a data set that's ready to go into Dataverse. You're able to link that eventual output to your original data management plan so that you've got that um, transfer documented in your DMP and it stays up to date over time. Um, after the post research phase, our space users can get an inventory of all the outputs associated with their project and tied to a DMP. They can use that for grant replying, reporting and compliance checking. Uh, I think that's an important thing, especially with upcoming new NIH requirements as people are really gonna be looking to see where your, where your eventual outputs went. Did you do what you said you were going to? Did they make it to the repository that you said that they were going to? Um, and then the final version of the DMP and all of the data associated with it can be exported into together into a repository um, such as Dataverse, which we'll talk about today. I think they're going to be doing an upcoming integration with Dryad and they have an existing one with Figshare as well. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Julie just to talk a little bit from a, a firsthand user perspective of how they're using it um, at her institution. Great, thanks so much, Maria. Um, great, so hi everyone. Um, I hope you can uh, see uh, the slides. Uh, so my thanks mostly to Rory for uh, getting this um, integration up and going um, and uh, for organizing this community call with Force 11. Uh, so, I'm here uh, with uh, Danny Brooke, who's gonna be talking a little bit about uh, some future integrations uh, with the Harvard Data Commons that Rory actually mentioned. Um, so to get started with FAIR data management um, at Harvard, sorry, I'm just gonna, hold on one second. Okay, that looks much better to me. Okay, um, of course I have another uh, data life cycle for you. Uh, this is a view of the data life cycle that we have created um, at Harvard that uh, multiple groups use. And it really just shows, you know, the multiple stages and how uh, storage is integral to the research process. Um, and I think it really does connect with the vision that Rory showed you at the end of his presentation, kind of integrating all of the planning, the active research um, and, and sharing data. Uh, so taking you quickly through this, this really just shows um, the integration uh, kind of with multiple tools actually going beyond just the, uh, the three that have been mentioned, uh, but creating a data management plan, linking it um, from DMP tool to our space, you know, collecting your data and your metadata actively in an ELN like our space, and maybe even linking in methods from other tools like protocols.io. Uh, collaborating and managing your analysis workflows within uh, an ELN like RSpace, 
uh, sending curated collections to preservation repositories, uh, which is something that uh, is coming and or hopefully coming and Danny will um, talk a little bit about that. And then of course, you know, publishing results while citing any published works like DMPs, protocols, data sets, uh, code, et cetera. And then of course, for the access and reuse, ensuring that everything, you know, meets these uh, fair data principles. Um, so to really illustrate this, we have a nice video. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and play this for you. Hopefully this works out um, pretty seamless. Here is a quick overview of the DMP tool our space integration, which facilitates linking together a data management plan and project outputs with minimal effort. Here I have my list of DMPs in DMP tool, and I am recording my research and storing the data in our space. I can easily set up the Dataverse and DMP tool integrations on the apps page enabling our space to directly communicate with these services. I can then browse DMPs inside of our space. I can filter by my DMPs and public DMPs and can select which DMP to import. Importing into our space will store the DMP as a PDF inside of a separate DMP gallery which I can easily view, as well as reference and link to within our space. Now, here is my research data for this project. I am ready to export my work. This is a straightforward process within our space as I can directly export to an external repository, such as Dataverse. I will make an HTML export and provide the information Dataverse requires, being sure to associate this export with the appropriate DMP. After the deposit is confirmed, I can view all of the research data in Dataverse. Most importantly, a direct link to the exported materials on Dataverse is then passed back to the original DMP in DMP tool as a unique and permanent related identifier, which supports traceability and fair data. This identifier is also recorded on the landing page for the DMP. This landing page serves as a public facing page listing all outputs related to this specific project. As additional data sets are published, these citations will be automatically added to the landing page, keeping the research materials and data management plan in sync throughout the research process. Here is a quick overview. Great, so I hope, um, I think that this video really illustrates uh, the, the integration and things Rory and Maria were, were chatting about and I'm trying to get out of this view. Okay, great. Um, so I don't really need to go through, you know, the specifics of the integration because uh, I think the video really highlights that but I really wanted to break down the tools and specifically the support that we're offering at, at Harvard, because it's not just you know, the, the integration, right? There needs to be um, some services um, and support behind what, what's happening. Um, so the um, Harvard Library offers support for DMP tool, um, and we offer some DMP review and consultation services like many libraries. Um, and we have um, a working group, uh, which, is a group of multiple research stakeholders across our campus who have um, created templates uh, that include you know, example text and links to Harvard policies and resources to really help researchers create their um, data management plans. You know, they can access these um, when they sign into DMP tool with their Harvard credentials. Uh, and we're hoping, you know, with that, you know, new NIH policy that Maria mentioned, uh, we will be updating our templates to reflect that new guidance. Um, 
And I'm also really excited about the work Maria mentioned regarding machine actionable um, DMPs because it will make those plans even more integrated with the process, hopefully, you know, kind of limiting the burden that I think a lot of the a lot of researchers will find with this new policy. Um, so we recently started a pilot with um, our space and our service is a collaboration between research computing, information technology and the library. Um, as we know, kind of ELNs are becoming more of a standard in research labs and Harvard is piloting two platforms right now, one of which is our space. Um, so of course we've integrated our space with other tools in the Harvard, you know, our Harvard systems to again, you know, just streamline processes, um, make it more efficient for researchers uh, to work where they're already working uh, with this ELN. Um, so I've listed some of the features we think our space enhances uh, for researchers, especially, you know, that linking to Harvard's research computing storage. Um, and other tools that we have um, through Harvard, like protocols.io, um, Gmail accounts, all of that. And of course, lastly, we do support the data repository Dataverse. Uh, this is a collaboration between um, the Institute of Quantitative Social Sciences, uh, the library, information te technology, Dataverse, um, and our Office of the Vice Provost for Research. Um, I just want to mention that we also recently have spun up some curation services. Um, these are fee-based services, uh, but they are specifically aimed at helping researchers ensure that their data sets are um, fair. And uh, just showing the kind of demo data set that was that was in the video. So just to you know wrap up this quick quick um, integration, um, I'm most excited about the the DMP tool piece. Um, having the DMP tied um, to the data set in Dataverse really removes a lot of the barriers for researchers to efficiently and seamlessly, you know, connect the research project products together. Um, as we saw from that kind of project page, uh, you have the DMP tool or DMP there, you have some project information, and then you have a list of all of the outputs um, just created for you. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to, to Danny, who's going to talk about some future integrations that we have planned at Harvard. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, and thanks for having me. My name is Danny Brook, and I um, am the program manager for product development at the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard. And we work um, mainly on Dataverse, but we also work across a couple of different tools um, as well. And then also a thank you to uh, Rory for, uh, for pulling this together. Um, Whenever I whenever I present with Rory, I do like to just thank him publicly for the um, the Java client library that that our space contributed back to the project. I think it's you know the the interoperability piece that we're here to talk about that's powerful, but also the community aspect and and different entities jumping into the um, the development process is super important. So thank you, Rory and, and team, for contributing that. Um, so it's been mentioned a couple of times so far, but the Harvard Data Commons is a project that we're starting on here at Harvard to basically provide a seamless integration of tools and data packages across the data life cycle. So I'm really excited to talk about it with this group and to have some good discussions around it. Um, but from the, from, the, from the planning stages where DMPs are involved to the data collection phases where um, you start to get in machine actionable um, data use agreements, to the, um, the analysis stage where you start to get into um, to, to, uh, our space and other, other tools and then to data sharing where you get, get into Dataverse and then all the way to long-term preservation um, where, we, um, where, where we wanna of course preserve that data. Um, but, but one important thing and just kind of going back to what Rory said is you know, it's, it's not a linear process. So sometimes we think of it that way, but an important stage is the idea of the reuse and reproducibility. So being able to move, to move throughout, throughout the stages um, as we're building. And so I wanna talk about some of the work that's actually going on right now. This is funded work through Harvard University um, about Harvard Data Commons. And I'll talk about three different objectives that we're working on. And again, the goal is just to better, um, to, to better integrate um, some of the existing tools that are out there and to build some new stuff. Um, so Julie, the uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is we're building Globus integration into Dataverse to allow um, data to be more easily moved um, from research computing, and then also allowing basically a metadata record to be created in Dataverse and to allow the data to remain in research 
computing because we want to support more sensitive data, larger data, and you know we see being able to provide tooling to more seamlessly move that data around is very important. Um, so this is this is the first the first stage in this work. Um, the, the contract has been signed and we are working on this now. So keep an eye out for updates in the near future. Um, so this is this is the first objective and the next slide. Uh, the second objective is around uh, better workflows and packaging. And we're looking at um, RO crate and, um, and Docker images. And the idea is to create packages with metadata and provenance and workflows and allow deposit of those into, um, into Dataverse. So kind of just beyond the replication data sets and other data sets that we support in Dataverse um, right now. And next slide. And then the last bit is um, a better integration with the preservation system um, at Harvard. And so it, it's interesting because in the Dataverse community, there are several different um, preservation models already in use. Um, for example, there's an Archivematica integration, there's um, a push out to a DuraCloud. And so there are um, other preservation workflows in use, but um, we wanna support as many as, as possible. And we're gonna be building some middleware to allow better preservation um, with Harvard's DRS um, system. So th th this is all work that's underway. Um, and right now we're building until June, at which, at which stage we'll reassess and figure out what the next steps are to continue with this um, important work. I think so, that's, uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, Chris, are you up next? All right. Uh, thanks, Julie, for the cue. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and thank you, um, Rory, again, another thank you for to you for the invitation and uh, to John and the uh, Force 11 community. But also thanks to everyone in the audience. I see a lot of um, familiar faces. So thank you for for coming. Um, yeah, I, I would. Uh, um, I'm here to talk to you about um, sort of the um, AGU experience, and I was looking something up about workflows and Docker while you were talking. So, um, but yeah, I, I, um, let me just uh, start my slideshow here. Um, so, um, first, I, I'd just like to start by saying that um, the work that we do at AGU is sort of a reflection of um, really of our own community, the researchers. And so, this is a position statement uh, um, that actually um, has been um, in existence since the 90s. Uh, so you can see that um, data has been really, you know, sharing data has been really central uh, to AG for a while now, um, you know, but as, as we've heard, um, you know, it takes, it takes community, it takes a lot of work to, um, to develop something further, but it really helps. Um, and, and I should also mention my colleague uh, who, um, couldn't be here at the moment, but Shelly Stahl, also in um, data, data leadership at, at AGU, um, um, this has really been central to the work that we've, we've been doing. It really enables us um, to, to further um, some of this work at AGU. Um, but also part of our strategic plan is, is, is um, you know, this is a, a, an opportunity to highlight the importance of open, open science as well. Um, so that's really central to what, what we, we want to do moving forward. Um, but um, just to borrow a line from the Beatles, um, with we get by with a little help from our friends. Um, really, you know, again, we wouldn't be able to do some of the work um, that that we do without um, all the sort of researchers in our community, um, librarians, um, you know, re really some some of the information science uh, professionals that are out there, um, people that are running archives. Um, really, it's it's all all. Um, across uh, different roles um, that that we work with and in, in sort of doing various things, and I, I thought I would start with just um, an example. Um, so this is something we, we put out recently um, to really help with um, elevating um, Jupyter notebooks and um, as a first first class uh, citizen in in the scholarly system. So we wanted uh, Jupyter notebooks to be um, cited, to be credited, um, to be recognized. And so we work through this initial guidance, um, but we're not stopping there. We're also working with um, other community members to move it forward and think about Jupyter journals and thinking about all, all sort of other ways that we can make this a reality. And it's not just the Jupyter side of things, but also the R community and you know R Markdown. We also have 
uh, another um, piece of guidance in that in in that sense. But this is just really one one example of of how we work with the community members. Um, the other thing is um, researchers need to see the value. Um, you know, it has to be easy. The road getting there is very is very bumpy, and maybe we heard a little bit about about that. Um, but like trying to really whittle things down into, you know, something that's easy for a researcher to use, you know, and Rory mentioned that just getting into the workflow of the researchers, um, you know, just, just uh, demonstrating the value. If they do this, then they'll see this, this benefit. And uh, the example I like to pull is, um, is, is one that um, actually was involved with a long, uh, it seems like a long time ago now, 10 years ago, um, um, but making, uh, your code uh, citable. So um, one of the things uh, back in the day, we worked with uh, CERN um, to make your, uh, you know, to, to create this sort of release mechanism um, from, from GitHub um, to, to cite your code. Um, and, and, you know, that was just a recognition, recognition of the fact that uh, we saw researchers um, using uh, GitHub in their workflows and really trying to create a simple mechanism for them to cite it. And then um, make that available in, in, in this, you know, the, the broader scholarly ecosystem. I would say that, you know, there's still work to be done. You know, that bumpy road is still there. Um, right now we're trying to make it so that, you know, the, the, the software is, is, is better curated and it's, uh, it's, it's easy, it's better described. And, uh, so, you know, that's the, that, that's one of the steps you take is just, uh, taking these simple steps and then building on that further. Um, but also, you know, it's the other way around of trying to find consensus in the community on that bumpy road and, and find a simple solution together. Um, and the last thing is you can't do it all. You have to focus and demonstrate the value. It's that, you know, there, there's so many things that um, Shelly and I like that come across um, our desks, you know, that we could do as a community that we could work together. But we, we, you know, we really have to focus on certain things sometimes and, and really, you know, move those uh, forward. And so one of those is actually, um, you know, this, this project, uh, an example of um, the, this pilot to, to um, work on um, better data citation, better software citation, and, and, and realize that in NSF PAR. Um, so we've got some initial um, data, initial findings. Uh, to really move this forward, and and there just today there was some chatter on Twitter um, about this, and and uh, just can't wait to to um, you know move move a lot of this forward in in the coming month or two. Um, but um, it's reflected in our guidance, so you know this is this is something we've been working on, sort of whittling down things to make them simple for authors, um, you know, to 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 understand what they need to do to realize that data or software citation, but it took a lot of work, you know, behind the scenes working with Crossref and, you know, people, people in the publication system, uh, data site, um, you know, just working with our researchers to, to pilot it. Um, so we're almost there <laughs> to realizing this, um, but, you know, that, 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 that process of sort of whittling things down was really a, a, a process working with editors and reviewers, uh, you know, authors, um, staff, and trying to simplify the process for everyone. Um, so yeah, that that's really just a quick and dirty um, uh, of some of the examples, um, some of the the things that we do to try and work with um, with everyone and and try and move these these things forward. Um, and if you want to, please feel free to reach out to Shelley or I um, for further questions. And I did drop one more example about working with very large um, data in, in the crypt pad, um, along with the link to the slide. So um, if we wanted to talk about that, then that's great too, but I'll stop there. Okay, thanks, Chris. Jeff, I think you're up next. Are you able to access everything? You're, you're muted just now. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, good, thanks. Well, I'll just get my screen shared and we'll get started. So, all good there? Yep. Okay. First of all, um, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you all here today. Um, I'm just gonna try and get this 
There we go. Trying to minimize the, uh, the people screen so that I can see my uh, screen. Give me a second here. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm just gonna get started here. As a bit of background, um, the RDM efforts uh, uh, in Canada at a national scale started with the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, uh, Carl Portage Initiative. The success of this initiative saw government funding provided um, an alignment with the work of the New Digital Research Infrastructure Organization, or NDRIO, in 2019. And as of April 2021, we are now fully part of the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, or the Alliance for short. The Alliance incorporates research data management, advanced research computing, research software, and aspects of cybersecurity into its mandate. Let me just try and get rid of this. Um, one moment, please. I'm just really struggling with uh, that's what I want to do. Thank you. Okay. I need to be able to see my display screen, so my apologies for that. So with that um, four-part mandate, the Alliance has developed a strategic plan. Um, and I was really grateful to see Chris's uh, strategic plan going up there for the AGU. Um, the plan at the Alliance was months in the making and benefited from input from over a thousand individuals across the DRI ecosystem in Canada. It highlights our commitment to the four strategic objectives shown on this slide. As part of our work, we're looking at a number of future scenarios including one that I will focus on specifically here today, the open trends and particularly how they apply to data. There are a number of open trends that are paving the way for open science. And I'm gonna drill down even further. We're working toward a shared understanding of the meaning, the opportunities and challenges associated with open science. And I'll be focusing today specifically on interoperable data management frameworks against the backdrop of the work we've been doing both before and after joining the Alliance. At the Alliance, we have profound desire and willingness to improve research to benefit humanity. To that end, it is no accident that the tagline of the Digital Research Alliance is to accelerate discovery. Our CEO, Nizar Ladakh, expressed the des this desire to accelerate discovery at a recent Alliance members meeting. He emphasized the fact that researchers need better support for data management and better access to specialized software and advanced computing power. And that partners are at the heart of what we do. And that was nicely emphasized by Chris as well. And you'll see the theme of partners throughout this presentation. Good research data management can be summed up as making data fair. I won't get into details on that. We already talked at length about the verification of data. And that is one of the underlying principles that drives our work. I will highlight now how our RDM efforts are helping to make data fair, though, by turning to the research data lifecycle. Yet another, in this case, linear rendition of this, but it is all ultimately cyclical. Starting with planning, the Alliance has partnered with the University of Alberta to support researchers in the development of data management plans, or DMPs, through the DMP Assistant, Assistant a national online bilingual data management planning tool based on the RDM, uh, sorry, the DMP road roadmap that was uh, mentioned earlier um, in, in an earlier presentation. Moving on, researchers start by creating, processing and cleaning, and ultimately analyzing their data. And this phase of research collectively is known as active storage phase of research, which often focuses on the use of advanced research computing and research software. One of our pressing challenges is to bring the RDM best practices into the active research and the active storage phase of the life cycle. And our being together in the Alliance supports us in addressing this. Our ARC colleagues have recently just joined us um, from being a separate organization at Compute Canada to being part of the uh, Alliance. So we wanna see uh, RDM, ARC and research software baked into the active storage phase, which is I think a lot of the themes that Rory and others have been talking about. 
After the active storage phase of research, researchers need to find a recognized repository to deposit their data for discovery and dissemination. We call this repository storage, and I want to disambiguate that with um, previous presentations that have talked about archiving and repositories and preservation all sort of interchangeably. We distinguish repository storage as being specifically for data discovery and disseminate, dissemination. And in this context, in addition to supporting um, disciplinary repositories in Canada, the Alliance RDM team partners with Compute Canada to develop and support the Federated Research Data Repository and a national instance of Dataverse. To round things out, we'll turn to preservation storage intended for the long term and to provide a copy of last resort. This kind of storage is characterized by processing data, metadata, and code into normalized packages called archival information packages using packages like using software like Archivematica. And depositing these packages into, into a growing network of preservation service providers. Together, active repository and preservation storage make up the data storage continuum. Our goal is to embed RDM best practices and interoperability into the research process from planning through reuse. Turning to reuse, the Federated Research Data Repository fulfills three roles. It is a bit of an odd bird in that way, and we're looking at we're looking at rebranding it to sort of break out the service components of this, of this platform. First, it is a repository for research data, particularly for large data sets. Second, it is part of a preservation pipeline for selected long, selective long-term storage. And thirdly, it is a discovery service. And in the context of that discovery service, we harvest over 100 Canadian, harvest metadata from over 100 Canadian data repositories and provide a, a sophisticated text and map based search feature. Turning to more overarching initiatives, the Alliance RDM team has already launched two relate, RDM related funding calls, one aiming to improve stewardship of Canadian COVID-19 research data and the other to help a cohort of Canadian data repositories achieve core trust seal repository certification, which is an internationally recognized set of criteria that when met are an indication of high quality repository services. We've also started work on a sensitive data repository pilot using FERDER, the Federated Research Data Repository. This pilot will see the development of technological solutions for securely encrypting, storing, and appropriately accessing sensitive data, along with the perhaps more challenging task of working with institutions across Canada to harmonize data deposit and sharing frameworks from an ethical, jurisdictional, and institutional perspective. Next, we have the Data Champions Pilot, which builds on the success of local data champions programs around the world to envision a national cohort of data champions working individually and collectively to affect culture change necessary in research, research to ensure good data stewardship and the verification of research data. And there are a number of areas of activity that our data champions will be involved in. Finally, looking to challenges and opportunities, uh, I've presented a range of platform services, projects and pilots, all of which touch to lesser or greater extents on the challenges and opportunities associated with providing complementary and interoperable tools at a national level. We're either investigating or doing a lot already from working with machine actionable DMPs and related to this, promoting adoption of persistent identifiers, building metadata and harvesting crosswalks for our repositories, embedding RDM best practices into the entire research data lifecycle, so data arrive at the deposit stage ready to be shared, to tapping into the creativity and enthusiasm of a Canadian data champions cohort to promote culture change in digital research. So the Digital Research Alliance of Canada is making progress on all of these and a number of other fronts all intended to support research researchers using digital research infrastructure in Canada. And with that, I will say thank you and turn it back over to Rory and company. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. That was a great, uh, a great, uh, I won't say ending, culmination. And uh, amazingly, we're three minutes before the hour, so, so we're right on time. Wow. Um, uh, we're even on budget since there's no money involved. Wow. Great. Anyway, this has been, uh, thank you to everyone. This has been really, 
I think uh, hopefully a really nice conjunction of uh, kind of top down, uh, bottom up um, from the trenches, uh, as well as uh, uh, points of view uh, that everyone has, um, uh, we've managed to collect together here today. So fantastic. So without further ado, um, we'd love to um, engage with, with people who are on the call, who I know, as, uh, as Chris said, many familiar, uh, familiar names and people who are doing interesting things as well. So I guess, okay, here we go. Yes, please use the hand button if you have any questions, comments. Sounds good. Um, shall we do it that way? And if you prefer, you can also, I guess, type, type comments or questions in, uh, in, um, uh, in the chat as well. So over to, over to the attendees. And, and indeed to the, the panelists, if, if you'd like to ask questions of your fellow panelists or make comments. There's a there's a at least one thing I'm going to point out is I I, I don't M Fox and Megan maybe um, but I don't want to assume <laughs> I think it's Megan uh, but yeah I mentioned that there's this very popular uh, NSF award right now about fair uh, fair RCN uh, that I'm sure a lot of a lot of people have seen um, but um, can really help towards further furthering all this and we definitely have seen it. Um, I've seen it in various places that, um, but um, be great to talk about that one. Yeah, that that's an exciting grant. Uh, hi, yeah, it's it's actually Merck Fox. Um, I'm the. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. All right. No, I no, thought, that's okay. I, I, I didn't knew. realize that I still just had a sort of. Yeah, I'll have to change that. Anyway, um, yeah. So I I'm involved with this RCN, um, and since it is an an RCN, which for those of you who haven't. <laughs> dipped your toes in that pool yet um that is the uh research coordination network um kind of activity um at the national science foundation um there's a series of projects and i'm sure i think uh, christopher you were referring just now to the um their new announcement of a fair open science uh rcn that they just announced um and at any rate, the the one that I had pointed to, um, the sampling nature RCN, is kind of uh, I think we used to call it an Internet of samples, but um, it is a way to start harmonizing, you know, physical material samples along with data um, to to you know, and and I like this word too, heritage. I use that word myself in my work. Um, that's the appropriate framework to think about it, but. Uh, the point I simply wanted to make is that the RCN here um, is, I think, available for you to, you know, kind of be involved as well if you would like. And I'll just put my email address here if anybody wants to follow up with that, and I'll check into it. Yeah, and just a shout out um, about ESIP. You know that that samples uh, conversation just happened at um, ESIP, and they were using our. Um, our AG, the AGU guidance on like thinking about how they could, you know, um, cause they're, they're working with data site now for, um, DOIs and, uh, um, but like how, how can they sort of, you know, develop the guidance on how to do that. So we are, we're working with them closely too. That's a really, they, they really come a long ways. Um, so it's exciting. Thanks for mentioning that. I, I jumped to the other thing, but samples are really, yeah, exciting too. Maybe I could just uh, uh, jump in there as well before we get to Lindsay's comment. And uh, that's an area of uh, very active current interest for us at um, with with our space, which is now in effect uh, two two applications which have been closely connected. One is the what you think of as the traditional electronic lab notebook, but but the newer module is an, is an inventory sample management module, which is deeply integrated with the ELN. Uh, which allows association of, of sample data uh, with the experimental record. And then as we saw today, uh, both kinds of data can then be exported to Dataverse and other repositories because it, it, one of the biggest issues in reproducibility 
is is people lose samples, they don't keep track of them, they're not associated with uh, with the research. And in that connection, um, we're uh, we're working on making a better incorporation of um, uh, of, of of relevant PIDs into the sample record and then hence into the record that gets exported. And that's the case both with, um, uh, with IGNs and also with, um, with uh, PIDs relating to biomedical research for working with Nita Bandrowski as well. So I'm sorry, I didn't catch, um, <laughs> Fox, I didn't catch your first name, but uh, I, I'd also be delighted to, uh, to follow up and learn more about, about what you're doing. So thanks for, thanks for bringing that up. Um, yes, Lindsay. Let's see, how does it work? If I click on Lindsay, will that allow Lindsay to? Uh, yep. Yeah, how do we do it? Go ahead, Lindsay, can you go ahead, please? Oh, yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, so one thing I know I've had a few discussions with and some other working groups is, you know, part of this process is connecting DMPs with workflows of what you're using to implement some things, right? Like how are you connecting development platforms what cloud spaces are you using aside from Globus? So capturing method and protocol like reusability is huge. So, you know, in a DMP tool, do I know all the different databases and platforms that were used? And then um, how are each components captured within those platforms? And are those being fed into metadata workflows and outputs? And so um, I'm just kind of curious about if, if those are things that are on the minds, especially with the digital, you know, um, object, fair digital objects and frameworks, if that's kind of in the discussion as well. Maria, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, if, if I'm understanding your question, I think those are a lot of things that would probably be recorded in the protocol, um, which um, our space has an integration with protocols IO and DMP tool does not yet, but it is something we're hoping to implement this year um, so that we could be sure that that information was recorded and attached to a data management plan. But that level of detail is usually not in a DMP. Um, I think for most projects, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm misunderstanding you, but that would probably be in the protocol, which, you know, in the R space kind of ecosystem is, is integrated into that. And we want to do it with the DMP tool. Um, and now that we have a good API, we can we can do that pretty easily. So. And I also now see Lindsay that you've asked a question in the chat, so I'll respond to that. So we we there is an integration with uh, between our space and GitLab. So I think I don't see why there would be any barrier to doing what you're asking in the uh, in the chat. Okay, so we are about five minutes past the hour. So that's, that's great. Um, we do have the panelists are willing to stick around for a little bit longer. Um, if you have any questions or any comments, please put them in chat. Um, I can go ahead and just say thank you um, to Rory and to everyone for uh, taking the time and making this uh, community call happen. Um, and thank you to all the participants. And again, thank you to uh, Force 11 and Dryad and eLife for sponsoring this series. Um, these, this recording will be put up on the YouTube channel in a, in a couple of days and we'll make sure to post it out so you can share it with others.